Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to cover one of the most important components of information systems, people. There's not a chapter dedicated to this module, so this is mostly a custom module. And why is the topic of people so important? Well, when you think of the other aspects of information systems, processes and technology, it's actually people who create these and manage these. And in organizations, at the heart of many technology implementation failures, it's generally people who are the problem, not uh, poorly designed technology. These types of failures can cost companies millions of dollars. Okay, so taking a broader perspective, um, as you transition to the professional stage of your life, you will work in the most diverse workforce to date. You know, people from many different cultures, backgrounds, and generations. So taking some time to understand the dynamics of individual differences and how to become more aware of your own biases and how they affect the way you think and the way you work with others. These are all exercises that we should, you know, all be working on as part of our lifelong growth and learning. I'm going to talk about generational theory, diversity and inclusion, and cognitive biases in this video. In section 1.3 of your textbook, there's you know a brief part at the end of it. Um, you'll find some information about careers and in information systems, but it's a pretty short part of the chapter. So you'll get a much fuller picture of what careers and information systems might look like by watching the video where I host a panel of my former students. They've gone on to have really successful careers in information systems. So to learn more about careers and in information systems, be sure to check out that other video. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about generational theory. So, you know, you've probably already heard in the media and the news, you know, talk about generations, whether it's, you know, baby boomers, millennials. So you probably already have some background knowledge on this, but there is actual theory about generations. So basically what this says is that a generational cohort is one that, you know, shares salient historical and socio-cultural events, things like, you know, shifts in popular culture, wars, uh, depressions, recessions, and, and these things shape its members' attitudes and dispositions throughout their lives. These shared experiences leave distinctive imprints on the cohort and manifest via, you know, different espoused beliefs, values, and behaviors. Okay, so this is kind of a loaded graphic that I found, and it's not perfect, but I, I kind of liked it because it has a timeline at the bottom, and it covers lots of different generations. Now, the, the years, the start dates, or the start years and the end years, you'll find that generational scholars don't usually agree on exactly what those are. So, you know, every time you do see that, you know, year ranges for generations, you can kind of just use them as guideposts. But as you mull over issues about diversity and inclusion, it might help to actually consider how different socio-political events throughout history across generations have impacted people's cognitive biases. So, you know, um, looking at this graph, you probably have noticed that, you know, at the timeline it, it lists various wars and, you know, the Great Depression and uh, stuff about the web, which we'll talk about in a moment. But it's also missing, you know, different um, important events, lots of them actually, that could, you know, shape an, a, a generational cohort. So, you know, women's suffrage was a pretty big deal, uh, as well as the civil rights movement um, in the 60s. There's the Great Recession that happened actually not too long ago. And, you know, lots of things, right? Like same-sex marriage. There was also a, a, another major global pandemic about 100 years ago. COVID-19 happening in 2020. So lots of these different events 
shape the people who go through them, particularly if they go through them during really formative years of their lives, like from childhood through early adulthood. Um, these are very salient years of our lives that will kind of leave an imprint or mark on us for the rest of our lives. And so I do want to come back to this web 1.0, web 2.0, because that's a big deal, you know, the internet and the World Wide Web, you know, we went from having like a very static web, you know, early or like mid to late 90s and, you know, transition to web 2.0, which is more, you know, social media and how you know a lot of the web today. And of course, we'll on the horizon is, you know, web 3.0 and, and that's stuff that we'll talk about. But many of you, when you look at this timeline, you can probably identify kind of when you were born and the things that you've been through since you've been born. So starting with millennials or uh, generation Y is what they're also referred to. You know, even if they're born in the 80s, they they did encounter the, the internet as, you know, a mainstream household kind of thing by the time they were adolescents or hit college. And they, you know, some of you might identify with some of these things too, because you kind of maybe straddle this generation and the next one, Generation Z. You might remember some old tech like, you know, TiVo and some earlier cell phones. Some of you might actually know what a VCR is and, you know, CDs to listen to music. But millennials were also the first generation to use social media and mobile devices at a fairly young age. And so they were the first to kind of be pegged in this way. You can see the cover of this Time magazine here where they're called the Me, Me, Me generation. And you've got someone who is, you know, holding up phone, I guess, taking a selfie. And so they're considered the first digital natives. And so digital natives are people who have only kind of known a life where they've grown up around different digital technologies. And, uh, you know, aside from the technology piece, another kind of salient mark on this generation and, you know, the generations that come after it, the, but this one, the millennials, it was they were the first generation to kind of experience um, school shootings as, you know, something to be concerned about. And of course, that's persisted through the generations that have come after, not just school shootings, but also mass shootings. So for me, you know, growing up, I never had to worry about a active shooter drill in school, but that's fairly um, mainstream now. So the next generation, uh, Generation Z, they're very, very much marked by technology and, you know, using social media and their mobile devices and kind of being in front of their screens a lot, referred to as the selfie generation. So here you see more and more where, you know, they, their technology is in their hands at a younger age. Those who were born kind of in the earlier part of Generation Z, though, you know, they might still not, you know, have had a cell phone until later, like, you know, maybe middle school. But if we take a look at the generation that comes after Zoomers or Generation Z, Generation Alpha, these are the ones who are still being born today. We don't even really fully know what this generation will look like. They're, you know still being popped out. But as you move forward and land internships and full-time professional positions, just know that you will be working in a multi-generational workforce. It's likely your supervisors and mentors will be of a different generation than your own. And as you advance in your career, you may end up supervising and mentoring people of younger generations than your own. So you should really try to keep tabs on these evolutions over time and try to understand the, you know, the socio-historical context that people have been embedded in and how this may inform their beliefs, values, and work styles. Okay, so I think this is a good segue into the topic of diversity and inclusion, terms I'm sure you've heard by now, but you may not fully understand what they mean and why it's so important for future business professionals to um, understand the importance of diversity and inclusion. Okay, so diversity. 
I can't underscore enough how important it is to respect and value diversity in the workplace. So what is diversity? It's basically understanding, respecting, empowering, and valuing individuals of different races, ethnicities, genders, ages, religions, um, disabilities, sexual orientations, and national origins. And with differences in education, personalities, experiences, skills, and knowledge. And inclusion is organizational efforts and practices that support collaborative and respectful work environment, encourages participation and contribution of all, supports a sense of belonging and acceptance among all, and, you know, removes the barriers, uh, discrimination, and intolerance in the, in the workplace. So organizations have made much better strides with diversity, though there's still a long ways to go, but it's really inclusion that organizations have struggled with the most. So, you know, they may be able to kind of have a mix of employees of different, you know, backgrounds, races, genders, etc. But kind of nurturing that organizational culture where all of those employees, you know, all employees feel included and accepted and respected. This is something that, you know, organizations are still trying to figure out how to best achieve. Um, Deloitte came out with a report that set, said that there's actually some generational differences in how diversity and inclusion are even perceived in the workplace. So non-millennials, or it should what that really means is older generations. They, it's not that they don't value diversity and inclusion, but it's, it's more, um, you know, something that they approach where they're sort of checking off boxes, you know, whereas millennials, and I, I presume, you know, generations younger than millennials, like Zoomers, are more likely to consider diversity and inclusion as, you know, as the way to be, like that is the way to innovate and um, achieve a business's goals. So kind of interested to see if any of you agree with any of this, to see if you have any thoughts on this. Here is uh, just sort of an extension of that report with, you know, quotes that illustrate these differing beliefs. But regardless of whether there are, you know, true differences in beliefs about diversity and inclusion across generations, we're still just talking about perceptions and beliefs here and not necessarily practice. Uh, so here's a quote from a female student from one of my courses in spring 2020. She expressed that she didn't feel valued on her team, where she was the only woman on the team. And despite telling her teammates that she could take on certain roles that had greater responsibility and complexity, they kept, you know, pushing her to continue working in a role that she didn't want. Um, and this was incredibly frustrating and marginalizing for her. So I bring this up as a reminder that it doesn't matter if you were brought up in a generation that might be more, you know, woke about these issues, it doesn't mean that it translates into the actual actions um, and practice that we all have to take in, in how we treat one another. So we all have, you know, learning and unlearning that we need to do to fully realize the potential of diversity and inclusion. Okay, so when I refer to challenges associated with people and in information systems, many challenges can just be traced right back to cognitive biases that people have. And we all have cognitive biases. Nobody is immune. If you're sitting there thinking, you know, nope, not me, I'm really objective and unbiased, that's kind of a type of cognitive bias in and of itself. So the sooner that people can be more aware of and recognize their own biases, the sooner they can do the work needed to address and overcome them. And the sooner they'll be able to recognize these biases in others, even in a workplace setting, and consider all those different strategies that can help overcome or reduce the harm that stems from these biases. And this is an ongoing practice, something you'll do for the rest of your life and being more aware of yourself and aware of others and what makes us all tick. It's not a one and done type of exercise. 
So looping back to technology implementation challenges I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this can often be traced to user resistance to new technologies. And, and uh, why would users resist you know, new technologies that can help an organization achieve its goals? One of the key biases involved here is called status quo bias. This is just people's tendency to prefer the status quo the way they've always done things. It's comfortable and many times more efficient. You know, people already have their established routines and ways that they like to do things. You may have noticed a lot of status quo bias in 2020 with a pandemic that disrupted everyone's lives. This type of bias makes it more difficult for people to adapt to new ways of doing things. Okay. So after this video, you'll see a series of short videos about cognitive biases in the workplace. These will tap at other biases like prototype bias, the halo effect, the horns effect, and confirmation bias. One of the videos also mentions the implicit association test, um, and this is linked under supplemental readings. If you want to take any of these tests online yourself, you might be surprised by your results. I've taken a couple of them, and I was, yeah, I was pretty surprised by my results and the bias that it highlighted that I have. So that's all I have for now. I'll see you in the next video.